day two of our celebration of Charles Darwin and the origin of species. Tomorrow, we have the option of two additional events. The first by Dr. Connie Burka, who's right here in the front row, who will give a seminar entitled Evolution and Religion, <coughs> Congress or Conversation on Alliteration there. She'll be holding forth in the building next door at 3 o'clock in room 104 Aronoff Lab, and you are invited to attend that if it interests you. Then tomorrow night, we have our annual religion and science panel discussion. One of the panelists is here, actually the panelists are here, Dr. Carol Nelly is up here in the front row. Uh, Dr. Burke will be back to serve on that panel. And we are blessed to have a very distinguished moderator, Mr. Dr. <coughs> also up here in the front row. If you would like to attend that, you can go to the live event down at COSI, or you can schlep over to the Boston Center Auditorium for the video link that will be provided there. So please feel free to come to both of these events if you have the time and the interest. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Ed Hughes received his BA in Liberal Arts from Hampshire College in Amherst, Mass. With dual concentrations in literature and journalism, he began writing professionally for a series of small newspapers, culminating in a position in the Orange County Register, for which he wrote a series of specialized articles on the military. This work was honored with a surprise in 1989. Mr. Humes subsequently decided to take a leave from journalism to write a book. <coughs> Nine books later, he continues to be officially on leave from his newspaper work, although his nonfiction writing, a unique combination of immersion journalism, investigative reporting, and narrative storytelling, suggests that he has never truly departed from the fourth estate. And the world is better for it. His books have illuminated some of our society's most vexing problems the deficiencies of the juvenile justice system, the unintended casualties in our war on crime, the hope and pain lived in a neonatal, neonatal intensive care unit, and the shaping of a generation by the GI Bill to name a few. Despite this heavy investment in writing books, Mr. Hughes frequently writes articles from major US periodicals and regularly receives invitations to lecture from prestigious organizations. Mr. Hume's work is clearly high impact, and not surprisingly, he's received many awards. Among them are included honors from the investigative reporters and editors, Associated Press managing editors, and many others. And while this impressive list of accomplishments would surely put Mr. Hume's on anyone's list of guest speakers, his presence here today is anchored in another of his achievements. In 2007, Mr. Hume's published Monkey Girl, Evolution, Education, Religion, and the American Soul. The book chronicles the epic court case of Pitts Miller et al., the Dover Area School Board, perhaps the most important legal case in our national struggle to understand the boundaries between science and religion. There are certainly other accounts of Pitts Miller. However, Mr. Hume's book is very different from the standard fair. Monkey Girl is at once a detailed history, an investigative report, and a page-turning story. The book is fair to all sides, honors the traditions that motivated the citizens of Dover to act as they did, and leads readers to an in-depth understanding of how a little town in Pennsylvania became the flashpoint in the conflict over teaching evolution in public schools. There is no more volatile issue and what we should teach our children, and who should decide what is taught. With rigor, humor, and wisdom, Mr. Humes makes sense of the controversy. He is, in short, the bringer of light rather than heat. And in that sense, Mr. Humes is the teacher our society so desperately needs. The war over evolution will no doubt continue. But as we progress through the 21st century and the age of science, the writing of Edward Humes will stand out as a signpost along the way, pointing to a future when evolution is viewed not as a thing to be feared, but as an essential part of understanding nature. So with that,
that, it's my great pleasure to bring you to the lecture. Well, are we uh, a very blush-worthy introduction? Thank you. That's you've been in touch with my mother, perhaps. <laughs> uh, can you hear me? Okay, I get this. Okay. Thanks. When I first arrived, does that need to be off or on? When I first arrived at the Ronald Reagan Federal Courthouse in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, for what was billed as the second coming of the famous Scopes Monkey Trial, one of the first people I ran into outside the big wooden doors of the courtroom handed me a little green square of paper. It was an invitation, and it was entitled to a lecture. It was, an, it was to a lecture entitled, Why Evolution is Stupid. And this fellow, he, he leaned close to me, and he said, you know, you can go in there and listen to the lies, or you can come to Dover and hear this and get the truth about evolution, because you're not going to hear it in there. Now, I had come to town in the fall of 2005 while researching my as yet untitled book, Monkey Girl, expecting to hear cutting-edge arguments uh, in favor of evolution on one side, pitted against this upstart idea, intelligent design, which posited that there was scientific evidence of design inside our very cells. And hear them I did. Really, this, what, what proceeded in that courtroom had to be one of the most vivid and enlightening displays of science in a courtroom in the history of this country and in, of jurisprudence. As they examined the question, could you teach intelligent design in a public school, biology class, without violating the principle of the separation of church and state? And yet that little green invitation... That, and the lecture that it led me to in the fire hall of Dover was every bit as edifying as anything I learned in that courtroom because it taught me a really essential truth about the culture wars in America when it comes to this question of where we come from. And that is there are actually two theories of evolution. First, there's the talk radio theory of evolution. And this is the version that packed that fire hall and had people up in arms as they listened to why evolution is stupid. It's the version that says life is accidental, a random crash of molecules that magically produced flowers and horses and humans, a scenario as unlikely as a tornado blowing through a junkyard and assembling a 747 by accident. This is the theory that says humans evolved from monkeys. But then, of course, why would there still be monkeys around? And the evidence against evolution is so overwhelming, and yet scientists embrace it. Why do they do that? Because they want to promote atheism. Because they are telling us a story that isn't grounded in truth, but is grounded in uh, an evil idea that has inspired such things as the Holocaust, that was integral to Adolf Hitler's philosophy, and that has led many people astray. It's the awful theory that pundits harp about on, in, on television and on radio. And yes, you know, that theory, that talk radio theory of evolution, really is stupid. It's no, no wonder that in poll after poll, we find that a majority of Americans reject or doubt the theory of evolution. It's no wonder that our students are increasingly turned off of science, that we're falling behind other countries when it comes to producing uh, uh, graduate students in the sciences and in engineering. Why should they do that? Because they keep hearing that our scientists are lying to us all the time. But then there's the real theory of evolution, and that was the one that was on display in the courtroom in Harrisburg. It's the one that you're learning about in your classes, no doubt. It's the one for which there has been overwhelming evidence assembled in labs, in fossils, in computer simula simulations, in DNA studies. Most Americans have not heard this theory of evolution. Teachers give it short shrift in our public schools, like the one in Dover. They do that because parents complain about it, because they are afraid of the reaction they may get from uh, uh, presenting this 
version of evolution. They're afraid of saying that this true version of evolution isn't random, that it doesn't say we evolved from monkeys, that it doesn't lead to genocide. They're afraid to say that those things are just made up to get people riled up and paving the way for pleasing but intellectually bankrupt alternatives such as intelligent design. So what is real evolutionary... Nice blank screen, sorry. Real evolutionary theory at its core tries to explain one thing. It explains how life forms change across generations by passing on helpful traits to their offspring, a process that, after millions of years, gradually transforms one species into another. This does not happen randomly, but through nature's unwavering tendency to reward the most successful organisms and kill the rest. It's why germs grow resistant to antibiotics. It's why amphibious turtles evolve into desert tortoises. And it's why dinosaurs and 99.9% .9 of all other species that have walked this earth or flown or crawled or swum across it are extinct. The environment changes, the recipe for survival changes with it, and life changes to keep up, or it dies. This was Darwin's signature insight. It's both brilliant and elegantly simple. But if that's all there is to it, if that... Oh, man. <laughs> okay, so I'm a Mac guy, and this is a Windows computer, sorry. <laughs> all right. So if it's all that simple, what's all the hubbub about? I would argue that it's really not about a genuine scientific agreement, because there really is none within the scientific community. Evolution is one of the most scientifically robust, tested, and well-understood scientific theories around. You know, we know more about it than we know about gravity. Scientists, uh, seriously, scientists have been searching for particles called gravitons for many years. This is, this is what makes gravity work. Theoretically, we know they're there, can't find them. You know, on the other hand, we do observe in the laboratory evolution. It has been seen. Not only changes in forms, but speciation as well. It's been documented. So, yeah, I, I said this in an earlier lecture in the Discovery Institute, which is the uh, organization that champions intelligent design, made fun of me. Oh, you know, Hume said that we know more about evolution than about gravity, but I, I maintain that that's true. And other scientists have told me that's true. So, okay, if the conflict, instead of being sci uh, scientific, is grounded in something else, what is that? I think it comes to a combination of poor education, of ignorance, of propaganda, of misunderstanding, and deliberate misrepresentation, and all coming together in kind of a perfect storm. Because the people who are upset about evolution have really been able to define it in the popular imagination. You know, uh, most of you probably aren't old enough to remember Michael Dukakis. You know, he was the, uh, the presidential candidate who was way ahead, beating George Bush one. He had everything going for him, except for one thing. He let his opponent define him. Evolution is the Michael Dukakis of science. <laughs> and the definition that most Americans understand and believe to be evolution is this cartoon, this false cartoon uh, of, uh, that I call talk radio evolution. So along comes the Kitzmiller versus Dover case. And the short explanation of that is a school board in the small town of Dover, Pennsylvania, uh, decided that they wanted to introduce an alternative to evolution, because they didn't like evolution. They weren't sure what it was, because they were later asked to testify about it and had a little trouble figuring out what it was that they didn't like so much. But they knew that they had to do something for their kids, and they wanted to present them with an alternative that was more uh, God-friendly, in their view. And that launched uh, this epic case, this, this constitutional conflict that uh, Susan Fisher just told you about. And the context that occurred in wasn't, wasn't in a vacuum, of course. There, it was part and parcel of a larger um, evolution war, so to speak. Uh, you know, the Ohio certainly had a pitched battle in considering new standards that would allow criticisms of evolution in 
uh, its public schools. That was going on at the same time as uh, Do the Dover case, as was a similar controversy in Kansas. The movement here in Ohio was ultimately deterred by the, the rather embarrassing defeat that the, the proponents of intelligent design suffered in Pennsylvania, but other controversies rose to, to take their place. There was uh, a marine biologist, for instance, uh, I believe this case is still pending. He sued the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, claiming he was fired because he rejected evolutionary bio biology. And there's the movie you may be familiar with called Expelled, starring uh, uh, ben Stein, who, uh, who I only knew from Ferris Bueller, but I, I suppose he's had more of a career than, than that. But uh, Expelled has recycled much of the, the evidence that was, was picked apart and discussed at length and, and basically uh, shown to be incorrect uh, in the Kitzmiller case. And yet you see this controversy continues to, to, to evolve, you know, pun intended. Uh, the, you may have, have gotten the impression that there's been a kind of war on science that started with the current Bush administration. Everything from denial of climate change to uh, uh, removal of protections for uh, uh, endangered species, including a variant of our, our national symbol, the, the bald eagle. But the part of that war on science that really caught my attention, and you may not know about this, uh, was the creation of, of a unit within the Justice Department uh, that handled cases having to do with um, uh, a violation of people's religious rights. Uh, I kind of call it the God Squad within the, the, the Justice Department. And they had a, a case they took in which they investigated a professor in Texas, a biology professor. And what they wanted him to do was to reverse his uh, uh, position on writing letters of recommendation for some of his students, which he refused to do to those biology students who uh, uh, would not accept evolution as, as uh, a well-grounded theory. Now, it wasn't that he was grading them poorly or treating them in a discriminatory, f discriminatory fashion. He simply didn't want to write recommendations, a voluntary <coughs> activity for any professor, and the Justice Department compelled him to do it under threat of, of prosecution or civil litigation and, and a very costly uh, uh, lawsuit. The full weight of the federal government brought to bear um, because he was supposedly interfering with the religious freedom of his students. You know, it was uh, not long after that we had uh, three of ten presidential primary candidates for one party say that evolution was bunk. And a vice presidential candidate even more recently who publicly states that we should teach both evolution and intelligent design in public school. The very proposition that the federal court in Dover rejected as unconstitutional. So on and on it goes. Oh, I, I should say, I'd never like to forget the lovely and talented professional liar, Ann Coulter, who sold millions of copies of a book, uh, Godless, after the Kitzmiller case, in which she reiterated uh, the case that had been so uh, uh, completely demolished in the, uh, in the trial and presented it as the true facts of, of the controversy. Now, the roots... Finally get to this slide that came up out of order, the Scopes Monkey Trial. Kitzmiller case is billed as the second coming of this, and, and you may be familiar with it, maybe through the film that uh, popularized it, Inherit the Wind, maybe you had a more historical grounding in the case, but the popular perception is that um, evolution won the day in that case. You know, there's that famous confrontation the, uh, uh, between Clarence Darrow and William Jennings Bryan in which... Uh, uh, the champion uh, of, uh, of atheism, Darrow, defeated the, uh, the, the uh, opponent of evolution. Well, there was such a cross-examination, but the outcome of the case, evolution, was, was, uh, was defeated. You know, this was a test case that was designed to overturn the Butler Act, which mandated in public schools that the only origin story that should be taught to our students is the biblical, biblical version of Genesis, not any other uh, more scientific version. The Holy Bible was to be the science textbook when it came to explaining the origins of humanity and the origins of life. It's hard to imagine anything that would be more unconstitutional than that. And, and the city fathers of Dayton had this idea that they could sort of uh, uh, revive a moribund economy and get some attention for, for the community by creating a, a spectacle. And they recruited John Scopes to 
uh, break the law in order to, to get the ball rolling on, on a test case for the Butler Act. It kind of backfired. It had to go down in history as one of the most boneheaded publicity stunts ever uh, undertaken because the town was held up to ridicule by H.L. Mencken and, and other members of the press of that era. This was the first big case that was broadcast live on radio. Uh, it was the O.J. Simpson trial of the century of its day. The greatest scientists of the age assembled to testify about evolutionary theory. But there was a complication. The judge was a creationist. You know, he made the entire courtroom, including Clarence Darrow, pray before each uh, you know, America's most famous atheist before every hearing. Each, each morning uh, opened with a prayer. And he decided, you know what, we're th the heck with this constitutionality question. We're not going to deal with that. And you know what, I don't really care about the science. None of those guys are even going to uh, count. We're not going to, uh, that testimony is irrelevant. All we're going to look at is, did John Scopes violate the law? Did he teach something that wasn't in the Bible about where we came from? Well, he had already confessed to that. So the case was basically decided uh, by, that, by that limited ruling. And sure enough, he was convicted. He was fined $100. And that was later overturned on appeal on a technicality. So the case kind of just disappeared. But it did have national repercussions. And what were they? Before 1925, when the Scopes trial took place, typical textbooks in high schools had you know, fairly complete units on Darwin and evolution and what the state of the art of the science was at the time. After 1925, evolution disappears from the textbooks. Not because there was any ruling that came out, but because there had been such a huge public backlash because of this case. The textbook publishers knew if they put evolution in their textbooks and their competitors didn't, their competitors would sell all the books. So there was a self-censoring. Evolution disappeared from pretty much from high school and some university texts for many years. What happened? The only reason it came back is because of the Cold War. Right? Oh my God, what's this Sputnik thing circling the Earth? How did the Russians get ahead of us in this this scientific endeavor of exploring space. We must do something. So there was a national move to improve science education as a matter of science, uh, national security. And Darwin found his way back into the textbooks finally in the 1960s. And the shouting about that has not stopped since. That's how we get here. You know, and there's been many court cases since then. Evolution has prevailed in every one of them. Uh, religious creationism laws such as the Butler Act were systematically ruled unconstitutional. An alternative was suggested, well, maybe we can teach something called creation science. This was an attempt to support the biblical account of creation through scientific evidence. Um, there was different examples of it. Flood geology was a really interesting one where the uh, there was an attempt to show that the geologic formations that we see, like the Grand Canyon or the fossils that appear to have been buried many millions of years ago, actually were placed there through the flood described in Genesis. And you know, scientists, again, have been deceiving us about what the evidence really means. But that idea didn't, didn't wash either. And the Supreme Court in 1987 found that creation science was a religious idea, not a scientific one. It was just cloaked in the language of science. And that was a very important ruling in, as far as uh, keeping uh, science and religious ideas separate in our public schools. It was the first time that was fully articulated, and that became an important element in the Kitzmiller case, because it was when creation science was found to be unconstitutional, uh, an insertion of religion uh, promoted by government in our public schools, that this new idea came to light. It called Intelligent Design. Its chief proponent was a group, I, I think I mentioned to you, the Discovery Institute in Seattle, Washington. And its philosophers and researchers garnered, garnered considerable and favorable publicity in the early 90s when they came forward with this beguiling, this seductive idea that they had found scientific evidence of an unnamed guiding intelligence inside us inside our cells. We had molecular machines inside us that could not possibly have evolved because they were so specialized and made of such amazing parts. All right, well, they were really made out of protoplasm, not gears and levers, but you get, you know, this, this is an illust for illustrative purposes that the uh, uh, 
design aspects of something called the bacterial flagellum in this case was, cr was somehow present in living things and could not be explained by Darwin's dangerous idea. Now, proponents of this idea say they can detect scientifically, rather than through faith, that uh, basically the footprints of a designer <coughs> inside living cells. Now, who wouldn't find that more appealing than the idea that we share common ancestry with monkeys and mollusks or whatever? If there's a designer, then we humans can continue thinking of ourselves as special and unique. If we evolve, well, we're just big Big, uh, just a part of a big family tree. So why is this not the same as the ideas that biblical creationists have presented and that were ruled unconstitutional for public schools? In some ways, it is the same. It, it recycles as part of its justification many of the uh, long-standing criticisms of evolutionary theory that creationists have advanced for decades. But it's also different. The ID, as intelligent design advocates call themselves, the ideas say that their ideas are not based on, in, on the Bible. No particular religion is invoked. Uh, God is not named as the designer. Uh, in fact, they explicitly say, we detect design. We're not saying who the designer is. You know, maybe it's space aliens. Who knows? We're not going to say just that we see the design. So that's the, that's the line that they draw. And, and there's a bit of a nod and a wink to this because everyone who's attracted to this idea understands that the intelligent designer is God. That's what they like about it. That's the, why it's such a beguiling alternative. But the hope was they could get around this idea that, Creation, that, that killed creation science because it invoked a creator. If we could just call it a designer and not say who or what it is, maybe, just maybe, a court will rule that we have not violated the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment of the Constitution. And this is the idea, this distinction, that this little school district in Dover seized upon to put their community on the map, just as... Dayton, Ohio tried to do so many years, Dayton, Tennessee, sorry, <laughs> so many years before for the Scopes case. Now, the problem the board had to grope with is that when they first started bandying about this idea, they kept talking about creationism. They kept talking about getting prayer and God back into the schools. And one of the board members had stood up and said, God and Jesus died on the cross for us can't we do something for him now? And then introduce the motion to bring intelligent design uh, into the curriculum. It kind of telegraphed where they were coming from. Uh, and that became important evidence in the case because one of the legal tests of whether a, a policy like this is constitutional is what the intent of the legislators, or in this case the school board members, w uh, was all about. And their intent was pretty clear. And there was documentary evidence of, of it. But they secured the uh, advice of a law firm called the Thomas Moore Law Center, which is in Michigan and is, was endowed by the founder of Domino's Pizza. And they um, build themselves as the sword and shield of people of faith. They, they're kind of, uh, they see themselves as the anti-ACLU. And they uh, suggested, you know, Dover School Board, stop talking about all this creation stuff and look at intelligent design because... That's the wave of the future. You know, little Dover could change the world. If you take this on, we'll represent you uh, if, or rather when, a lawsuit is filed and we'll devote our legal resources to you at no cost. So now the school board said, hmm, you know, we could, we could push the envelope, maybe do something really uh, good for God and for our community, if, uh, and it's not going to cost us anything. So... Next thing you know, intelligent design was introduced into the courtrooms of, uh, rather, the classrooms of Dover through this statement. And basically it explained to uh, students that evolution was flawed, that there was an alternative, that they could have access to a textbook that explained more. And 
students, oddly enough, were forbidden to discuss it. They weren't allowed to ask questions. It was the you know sort of secret knowledge that would be conveyed to them, but then be quiet about it. No, I, I've never heard of a school that instituted a policy where you could learn something but not ask questions about it. But that was their policy. And then they sent home a newsletter to the entire community to educate them about the new discoveries of intelligent design. As, it, as the newsletter explained, scientists have discovered a purposeful arrangement of parts which cannot be explained by Darwin's theory. Living cells cannot be explained by chance. So the entire community, not just the ninth grade biology classes, were being educated about the evils of evolution and the wonderful new discoveries of intelligent design. Now, you will not be surprised to learn that the new policy in the newsletter were written over the objections of the entire science faculty in Dover and without input from anyone with any expertise in evolution or biology. The school board majority that championed this policy had no scientific training, but they did know how to get things done. Uh, they threatened to fire teachers who failed to support the new curriculum, and they destroyed tape recordings of meetings in which creationism was discussed, and then later denied ever discussing it at all. Too bad they didn't, dis <laughs> the minutes you just saw from previous meetings, they forgot to get rid of those. A lawsuit from 11 parents, one of whom was named Tammy Kitzmiller, and whose ranks included two Dover teachers, soon followed, with the parents asserting that the school board had violated their First Amendment rights by introducing religious ideas into public school and that intelligent design was just a rebranded form of creation science. <coughs> and so finally, 80 years after Scopes, a true trial of the science of evolution was in the offing. Because unlike the Scopes case, in the Pennsylvania case, science r literally stole the show. The judge basically said, bring it on to both sides. I want to see your best. I, and I want to weigh it. I want to see it. I want to smell it. And we'll see who's really got the goods about this really important question. What do we teach our children? And what do we really believe about where we come from? Now, the scientific testimony that emerged in this case was really compelling. It was uh, frequently beautiful. Spectacular fossils of, of walking whales, of feathered dinosaurs. Um, uh, in the midst of the case, the unraveling of the chimpanzee genome came about. And it provided a perfect test of the theory of evolution. Because, of course, as you know from your science classes, for a theory to even be a theory, it has to be testable. It has to be falsifiable. Darwin didn't know anything about DNA. Nobody did. Uh, uh, genetics was not understood, uh, or it had been forgotten uh, and rediscovered later <laughs> in Darwin's time. But if evolution is true, and we has ha share a common ancestry with other primates, there's a problem, because humans only have 46 chromosomes, and chimpanzees have 48. Gorillas have 48. What happened to the chromosome? An organism can't lose that much genetic information and survive. It would be fatal. So either this disproves evolution, and the, the intelligent design guys have been right all along, or something had to have happened. And what has to have happened? We have to be able to look inside the genome and find that where uh, the extra pair occurs in other primates, there's a fused set of chromosomes in the human genome. That's the test. Is it there? Well, it turns out it's there. That the marks of a fusion, where you see the two ends and the two middles in one pair of chromosomes, were present exactly where evolutionary theory predicts they had to be. Now, it's often said by the opponents of evolution, well, you know, none of this has ever been proved. And yet here, in a, in, in a type of science that didn't even exist when the original theory of evolution was conceived, uh, provides a very telling test that, in fact, common ancestry, the idea that all living things on Earth share a bond, a, a familial bond, uh, is borne out, at least in this instance, through the very genes that 
the intelligent design advocates say show um, something very different. Now, there's a paleontologist from Berkeley who uh, had an amazing slideshow. I only have a few of his examples here uh, that you can find uh, online in its entirety if you're interested. Um, you know, he answered this idea that, well, you know, one of the problems with evolution is there's none of these transitional forms between species. You know, where, where's the evidence that things change from one thing into another? And he said, I got a museum full of them. Here's the slides. Let me show you. Here's the dinosaur with feathers and claws that turned into, you know, with midway between dinosaur and bird. You know, here's the ambulocetus, the walking whale, a whale-like creature with legs. If, if that's not a transitional form, what is? You know, it's very ironic that some of these fossils were found in Kansas, which was a hotbed of uh, uh, anti-evolutionary theory. They have these amazing chalk formations, entire oceans that vanished, and these, these amazing creatures. Uh, not necessarily these, but others. You know, you'd call them sea monsters if you saw them in real life. They're buried there in the chalk. How'd they get there? You know, why does the, the bones in the wing of a bat exactly correspond to the hands of a human? Why does uh, those same finger bones occur in the flippers of a dolphin, but not in the flippers of a fish? Nor do the bones occur in the wings of a bird. Why? Because if evolution is true, it's easily explained, because we all share and come from the same basic mammalian model of phalanges, digits, and, and the very same bones. An intelligent designer would hardly do that, but if evolution is true, if it's really a cobbling together of whatever's available, you know, it's not a master designer at work, but kind of a jack of all trades, you, you work with what you got, it makes sense. Now, just as stunning as the presentation of uh, evidence in favor of evolution, perhaps even more stunning was the repudiation of the evidence that supported intelligent design. And one of the stars, one of the, and, and really the only, one of the few working scientists in the intelligent design moment, uh, movement is a, uh, a molecular biologist named Michael Behe from Lehigh University. He was subjected to the, what had to be the most withering cross-examination uh, I've ever seen, and that Judge Jones, who presided over it, said he'd never seen a cross-examination like it in all his legal career. It left... Mr. Behe and his ideas in tatters. The supposed peer review of his, his breakthrough book, Darwin's Black Box, you know, the kind of one of the, excuse the word, Bibles of intelligent design, uh, w he had claimed had been more rigorously peer reviewed than uh, most scientific journal articles. And the evidence revealed that peer review to have consisted of a 10-minute conversation with a professor of veterinary medicine who hadn't actually read the book. He thought it sounded like a good idea, though. Behe's signature idea of irreducible complexity, this idea that complicated molecular machines could not be possibly the result of evolutionary processes, was falsified in every example that he cited, being those. The most telling thing that came up, though, was that he was forced to admit that in order for intelligent design to qualify as, a, as legitimate science, the meaning of a scientific theory would have to be expanded, to use his term. It would have to be expanded so far that astrology would also become a legitimate scientific theory. Now, I don't want to knock anybody who likes to read their horoscope, but I don't think too many people in this room would think that astrology is on the order of uh, relativity in terms of scientific theories. But in Behe's world, that would be necessary for his idea to qualify as science. So in short, intelligent design as a scientific idea went down in flames in Dover. It was re revealed to consist almost entirely of warmed over and discredited criticisms of evolution that had been thrown up for decades. Equally revealing was the analysis of the intelligent design textbook of pandas and people, which you see here. The lawyers for the plaintiffs, for the parents in Dover, got a hold of, through the power of a subpoena, 
the original draft of the predecessor book of, of Pandas and People, the first draft of the book that became of Pandas and People. And you see that it's about creationism and explains what creation means, what the creator did. It was a book about creation science. It was written shortly before the Supreme Court decision that ruled that creation science was unconstitutional. Then that opinion comes out and a second draft is written. Oh look, it's the same passage. Intelligent design means the designer did. It was a cut and paste job and they went through hundreds of examples of one draft to the other where creation and creation science and creator was replaced with intelligent designer, designer and so forth and nothing else in the book changed. Something else that was quite revealing was a once secret internal document from the Discovery Institute called the Wedge Strategy. Now this is a document that explained the uh, actual religious nature of the supposedly secular idea of intelligent design. It turns out intelligent design isn't really a new idea at all. In one form or another, it's been around for millennia. Aristotle wrote about it in his own way, as did Cicero, and as did Thomas Aquinas. It's one of his five famous proofs for the existence of God. Indeed, that's what they called the argument from design. In Darwin's day, uh, it was a, a thinker named Thomas Paley who restated it as the watchmaker's analogy. This is the notion that if you're walking along the beach and you find a pocket watch lying there, in a f or lying in on a field, actually, was his example, you would never assume that it was created by chance or by random forces. It's clearly the product of an intelligent designer. And then he said, okay, take that example. Now look at the exquisitely designed uh, nature of a sparrow's wing or an earwig's antenna. It's clear that they, too, have been designed to exactly meet the needs of the organism and the demands of its environment. Paley argued that there was no difference between the watch and the, the evidence of design he sees in nature. It was clear. Intelligent design is basically saying the same thing as Paley did, but they're doing it with a microscope. Now, Darwin found Paley's watchmaker analogy and, and his thinking convincing in the classroom, but then he undertook his famous voyage on the Beagle and it convinced him that the natural world had a different story to tell. Because you probably have read about his trip to the Galapagos and where he found 13 separate species of finches, which clearly had migrated from the mainland to the islands, but then had diverged from another, had formed separate populations and developed different appearances, different kinds of beaks, each suited to fit the needs of its own environment and yet different from the others. How had that change happened, and why? What force made it work? Why did the giant sloths whose bones Darwin recovered on his voyage go extinct, while other creatures in the same environment continued to thrive? How was it that some animals he saw seemed poorly designed for their environments? What about the, the woodpecker that lived in a treeless terrain? What about those land birds he saw that had webbed feet, yet they managed to adapt and survive in their environments despite what appeared to be rather poor design? What intelligent designer would have intended that? Why did pythons have vestigial legs? These were the questions that Darwin was asking. Now he was doing what, in, in trying to find a natural explanation for this, his idea of natural selection that explains how the, res the recipe for survival can make those changes, make that appearance of design occur. He was doing what science has required since the Enlightenment which was finding a natural explanation for the natural world. Every significant scientific advance since the time of Newton has rested on this premise, this resistance to saying those stars are too complicated, that cell is too complex, God must have done it. That's what intelligent design is really about. That's what these documents in the wedge strategy explain. They want to roll back the enlightenment. They want to redefine science to include the supernatural. That's what Behe was talking about when he said we have to redefine science. We have to make it bigger to include religious ideas, to include supernatural forces. It's what the judge in Kitzmiller, Judge Jones, would have had to do in order to find in favor of the Dover School Board. He would have had to say, you know what, science ought to include the supernatural too. Now, 
it makes sense to ask the question. You might well ask it. Why should we exclude the supernatural? Why should we limit science to natural explanations of nature? Well, the key to that is in the word limited. You know, it's the sense that the scope of science is kept deliberately smaller than the larger scope that religion is meant to address. You know, it's paradoxical, but that limitation is what has led to all the scientific advances that we so value now. Uh, you know, when you stop seeing lightning bolts as a manifestation of divine anger, uh, then it makes sense to put a lightning rod on your house. You know, it's not going to save you from the wrath of God, but it will save you from an electromagnetic natural phenomenon. And it's that kind of thinking of limiting your inquiry to a natural explanation for uh, the phenomenon that once seemed so inexplicable that has allowed the advances that we enjoy today in our iPods and in our DVD players and in our X-ray machines and the hospitals that we rely upon. All of that rests in the idea that we're going to limit science to certain areas and leave the supernatural to religious thinkers and philosophers. So Judge Jones, the Kitzmiller judge, heartily endorsed this idea that advanced by several of the scientists and the philosophers and the theologians who testified uh, in his courtroom that because of this, these different canvases that science and, and religion address, the whole idea of the conflict is, in the, is bogus. It, it may be true that people who are focused on a literal interpretation of the Bible are threatened by all sorts of scientific theories, not just evolution, but pretty much any theory you can name. Uh, the judge found, as did most of the observers at this trial, that the ev testimony and evidence he received that the main, mainstream religious belief in God is not at all threatened by evolution. You know, the most ardent defender, the first witness in the case was a uh, Brown University professor Ken Miller, who said, you know, evolution is one of the most powerful and well-tested uh, theories uh, science has going, and also I believe that God is the author of things, all things seen and unseen. And there's no conflict between those two positions in his mind. Uh, and, and Judge Jones accepted that and reiterated it in his opinion. In fact, he didn't even say intelligent design was wrong. He said it might be right in his opinion, it's just not science. You know, let, let religion and intelligent design address the questions of why are we here? You know, where are we going? What's the purpose of life? Science doesn't have a clue. But keep, don't bring that, those sorts of inquiries into the realm of a high school science class and claim that they're scientific. His, his opinion is available uh, online for anybody to read. It's eloquent. It's... Uh, easy to read. It explains and reviews the major testimony in the case. It's clearly well-reasoned and well-thought-out. And he was rewarded uh, for that by uh, death threats. He needed a 24-hour bodyguard for uh, an, a period of time. Lifelong Republican judge, but of course he was immediately branded by uh, Ann Coulter and, and her likes as a liberal activist judge. You know, yeah, got to rewrite history to fit your assumptions, I suppose. And in that reaction, I think this case sheds light on a really important question that, that, that stops being about where we come from and starts being about where we are going as a, as a country, where our culture is taking us, where our, our, our divisiveness is taking us. Because, you know, as I told you before, when these school board members were compelled to testify about what they really knew about the ideas they were championing and rejecting, they just couldn't do it. They had no idea what intelligent design really said and no idea what, what Darwin or evolutionary biology currently says. You know, Judge Jones used the term breathtaking inanity ultimately to describe the uh, attitude of the, uh, of the school board members. And he, he has more recently expressed concerns that even though he felt he was trying to settle some of these questions in this case that, that nothing ever seems to uh, evaporate this conflict. 
Uh, I agree with his, his assertion that one of the possible solutions uh, to that is to improve the way we teach science to our kids, to not water down the teaching of things, uh, theories such as evolution as we're currently doing it, but to, to, to bolster it, to boost it, to try and uh, not only interest students and their parents in these ideas, but to show, reveal them to be uh, non-threatening to their other beliefs. You know, there was a, a survey published in a journal called PLOS Biology that showed that this would be a daunting task to undertake. It's just not happening. Nearly a, here's the stats. Nearly a, quarter of, nearly a quarter of public school biology teachers include an hour or more of teaching on intelligent design or creationism. Right now, you know, even though the only legal rulings on it that exist say that it's unconstitutional to do so. 48% presented ideas as a scientifically valid alternative to evolutionary theory. Again, a contention that was smashed by the evidence produced in the Kitzmore case. 49% informed students that many reputable students, scientists believe ideas as a scientifically valid alternative to Darwin. That's false. And while only 2% of the teachers surveyed entirely excluded evolution from their classes, more than one in six teachers omit mentioning human evolution. It's just too darn controversial. And 16% of public school biology teachers are young earth creationists who believe humans appeared in their present form in the past 10,000 years. Evolution is really barely being taught even by those who fully accept it because there's too much fear, there's too much concern. You know, Dover, of all places to be the, the, the uh, touchstone for this conflict, they were barely teaching it. It was the last unit they teach at the end of the school year. The kids didn't even remember it by the time they came back in the fall. It was, it was an almost meaningless set of lessons, and yet that's, this became ground zero for the evolution wars. So wh where, is it, where is this conflict heading now? You know, the, the case had a resolution. It seemed to be a very definitive one, but it doesn't have uh, legal force over anything other than uh, the small district in Pennsylvania where Judge Jones serves. And instead of it discouraging these conflicts, it really is only morphing into uh, a, a new phase uh, where the argument is not so much over teaching intelligent design as it is to uh, an argument over what is religious freedom, what is academic freedom. Uh, the case that I uh, think illustrates this, this coming wave of, uh, uh, of in the evolutionary war occurred in a place called Kearney, New Jersey public high school teacher was secretly taped by a student as he pronounced evolution a lie and told his young charges that they'd go to hell if they didn't accept Jesus as their savior. Now, whether, regardless of what you believe, I think most people would accept that that was inappropriate and unconstitutional for a public school. Yet after the student complained and handed over his recording, to the principal, and the story came out, can you guess who the community rallied around? Well, the boy was vilified for revealing this secret catechism, which apparently had been going on for years. The town supported the teacher, and the main argument on his behalf was one based on his religious freedom. How can we silence him from proselytizing in public schools? Wouldn't that infringe upon his rights? Wouldn't that infringe upon the students' rights who wanted to hear this information? This is, I, I'm quite convinced this is the next battle, this blurring of God and government. It's not going to be about redefining science. It's going to be about redefining our Constitution. Teaching evolution will be painted as a violation of religious freedom and teaching its alternatives as an embrace of those same freedoms. And just as we're paying the price for teaching evolution and science badly in America, we're going to pay a price for failing to teach the Constitution's and, and the founding principle of our nation well also. You know, pandering and ignorant politicians will tell you all the time that America is a Christian nation as opposed to a nation of Christians. And our laws and our schools should reflect that. It's false. The only mention of God in the Constitution is the phrase, in the year of our Lord. You know, one of our great patriots, John Adams, was president when he signed 
and the Senate passed unanimously the Treaty of Tripoli, which contains an explicit restatement of the idea that America is not a nation founded on Christian principles. We are a nation founded on religious freedom, which has to not only mean freedom of religion, but freedom from religion or from somebody else's religion. You know, the moment the government through its public schools or in any other fashion begins promoting religious ideas, as was happening in New Jersey, freedoms died. So, as hard as it might believe, at least to me, that someone would embrace this topsy-turvy argument about religious freedom as it was being done in New Jersey, I have to tell you that there was a resolution to that case. It got some attention in the New York Times. It was publicized. The school board was embarrassed. They told the, the preacher teacher, as he was called, to lay off. Uh, but they had a more final solution to eliminate future problems like this. Now, can anyone guess what that was? They banned tape recording. Very good. <laughs> Problem solved. And with that, I would open up the floor to your questions. Got a bottle of water by any chance? You got a bottle of water by any chance? So, who's first? Nobody? Well, that's too easy. Oh, yes. Uh, the question is, uh, the question is, how, I guess, how, how, what, what do I do to choose my the topics I write about? Um, well, in the case of uh, of Monkey Girl, it, it was the the action of the school board in Dover that attracted my attention. It was publicized in the in the press, and um, it was fascinating to me. I, I I knew it was a compelling story, and that that really was the prime consideration. Well, it has to be something that is, thank you so much. It has to be something that uh, has, has value b b besides just being interesting. I mean, this is an, I considered this to be a very important uh, issue to, to air out uh, and, and that it warranted a, a more than uh, the newspaper level of treatment that it was getting. You know, I wrote a book about juvenile court. Uh, at a time when there was a huge move to basically dismantle the juvenile justice system uh, under the assumption that trying young uh, criminals as adult would be a superior way to keep us safe, uh, to punish them. And I thought it was important to look at those assumptions because it turned out none of it, those assumptions were not true. So the, 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 there's a different calculation for each subject I take on, but the, the combination has to be a compelling an interesting story, but also a, a, an issue or subject that's really worth exploring for, for reasons beyond just the, the prurient interest.